Buenos días a todos, ¿cómo están? Espero que estén bien. Vamos a dar comienzo entonces al, al acto académico de hoy. Eh, lo que querría en primer lugar es darles a todos la, los buenos días y saludar a todos los asistentes a esta reunión, que sin duda será de mucho interés para todos nosotros, ya que hoy tenemos el privilegio de recibir en este Consejo Argentino para las Relaciones Internacionales a dos importantes eh, expertos en, amb, ambientalistas, los señores Anders Wickman y Jim Hall, quienes nos darán su visión, muy valiosa por cierto, de cómo Europa está afrontando el desafío del cambio climático, especialmente en lo que toca a la adaptación, que necesariamente debe darse en el caso en que las políticas de mitigación eh, no sean lo suficientemente eficaces. Eh, como ya hemos anunciado en la invitación cursada por nuestra institución, la reunión se desarrollará en idioma inglés. Tengo entendido que el señor Hall será el primer orador y que el señor Wickman eh, llegará con un pequeño retraso, por lo cual daremos comienzo a este acto académico sin su presencia inicial. Eh, permítanme ahora unas muy breves palabras de bienvenida en inglés en honor a nuestros invitados de hoy. The Argentine Council for Foreign Affairs is highly pleased to welcome today two very, two very esteemed environmentalists, Mr. Anders Wittmann and Mr. Jim Hall. They will be addressing very important environmental issues as those concerning the challenges posed by climate change and the European perspective in confronting those challenges when mitigation policies may be insufficient and adaptation becomes the most relevant policy matter. Our program today will start with an introduction by our former Secretary of State for Water Resources, Mr. Pablo Veres Artua, who is a distinguished engineer and a very esteemed scientist who has dealt with important environmental concerns. You have the floor, sir, Mr. Veres Artua. Thank you, Ambassador, and welcome everybody. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be uh, holding this uh, meeting. And I also want to thank uh, Professor Jim Hall, who is already online. So in order to uh, initiate the exchange and before giving the floor to, to Jim first and to Anders later on, I'd like to share with you a presentation, a brief one, uh, with a couple of highlights. So let me see if I can do that. Of course. Go ahead. Okay. So I think you are already watching the, the, the PowerPoint, right? Is is it correct? Yes. So of course we 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 are here because uh, we'd like to to have a conversation and to listen to the ideas and experience in Europe regarding how to face uh, the challenges of climate change and in particular of adaptation, which we believe is very, very significant for Argentina. So most of the people attending this meeting already knows several of these issues, but this is mostly for uh, sharing some uh, highlights with uh, Jim Hall and Anders before our exchange. Argentina, as you can see, is a very heterogeneous and a very large country and has plenty of issues regarding climate change and the impact of climate change in our economy, our social issues and environmental issues, and in general as a potential key um, strategy for getting to sustainable growth uh, of our economy. So what I will do is very briefly uh, highlight a couple of uh, uh, issues and challenges that we face uh, with a few images, and I will go as I said before, quickly through some of these dots so that you have an idea on what we are talking about. So, of course, a, a key issue for us has to do with um, understanding what is happening with uh, the ice melting. Argentina has a very long extended presence in Antarctica. And um, as we know, 
this is already very much under uh, uh, research. And in fact, I know that Jim uh, visited Ant Antarctica a couple of times, and um, we can already share information at a very high level on the real changes that are happening that will impact for sure with a, a, a significant increment and it may be even quicker that we were expecting of the sea level um, that will have significant, as I said before, impacts in our economy and our infrastructure as a general. Let me go to the other extreme, Argentina, and this is just a satellite image from Google Earth on the area of Cusho. Argentina is actually a country with 70% of its territory dry. So the idea of um, investing and developing policies and strategies for adapting all this area, and some of these areas are key for population growth, like for example, Mendoza, and also for employment and for uh, adding value industries, like food and wine, for example, and tourism in the case of Cusho, and in some of the other cases of the more arid uh, lands in the country, all of them are facing uh, currently um, big challenges in terms of uh, water resources, availability, and also some of those challenges are uh, uh, becoming even legal issues between the different provinces of the country. Uh, so this is happening and it is very significant. If we go all the way up to Chaco, this is another dot in the northern part of the country, and we compare images as NASA is showing us here, between only nine years of difference to 2019 and 20, uh, 2000, we will see a high rate of deforestation happening in the northern part of the country, as you can um, see in this image. Now, let's move to the Mesopotamia. And this is a key area. Here you have a comparison of two images where we do have water. Actually, in the 30% of the territory where we do have water, we also have more than 60% of our population and a large part of our economy. And some of these ecosystems are very fragile and they need to be handled and uh, managed uh, very carefully. So this is our delta and it has 500 kilometers um, of uh, one dimension and over 150 in the other one. As you can see, the water uh, management for an area like this can uh, really imply uncertainty. And the climate change is also showing uh, an incremental impact in that area. So this is the delta if we see it from Buenos Aires till the city of Santa Fe. Now, just to give you a sense of what we are talking, very recently we had a historical low for the river, uh, for the Parana River uh, water flow. And the tunnel that is uh, between the cities of uh, Parana and Santa Fe, all the way up here in this image, very up here. You probably can see my cursor here. And it's a key infrastructure for linking Mesopotamia and these two provinces uh, was for the first time uh, uh, at the real risk of uh, not being sustainable. So it, ha it had to be closed and the, um, these uh, heavy uh, pieces of concrete that were uh, placed on the top of the tunnel, um, for the first time they were appearing. So the, the water level was so low this is only a few months ago that uh, we were able to see these structures for the first time. And this is not only a matter of security and transportation, but it is also a matter of logistics. The Parana River is a key axis for getting our agricultural production mainly to the world markets. So uh, this is a, a good example to start to understand that this is a very complex system and uh, when you change the conditions uh, and all of them are linked to the climate variability and the climate extremes and the climate change and the, at the end of the day, you are facing plenty, plenty of challenges in many different uh, dimensions. In the case of the Parana River, this is also a watershed that is shared by five countries. And some of the consequences of the water level here have to do with decisions that are actually taken in Brazil. So this is again another picture of how low the water level was for the first time only a few months ago. Now let me 
uh, move very quickly to the uh, urban areas. This is Buenos Aires, uh, over 14 million people in that image there. And uh, the challenges of adapting the system to the water cycle are uh, very big and they are increasing. Of course, this is not new, but the, the, the impact and the speed of the challenge uh, is, uh, is uh, <clears throat> faster than it was in the past. Uh, this is a picture of the first uh, structure that was built uh, to control one of our main water streams in the city. This is from the 40s, in the last century. And as many of you know, very recently we were able to do a major structure, which are these two um, uh, blue tunnels. They are very big, very large, a lot of investment. So infrastructure is one of the solutions. This is underneath the historical one. You can see the historical box here and the new ones we built. At that time, uh, when we started that, I used to be director of infrastructure of the city of Buenos Aires. This is 2008. Uh, it was really a big challenge that it was possible to, to, to solve. Now, we have to be very clear that this is not a full solution. This is only uh, a way of uh, getting to a recurrence of uh, 10 years for these events. And if you don't do other things, it will not be enough for the increasing of the resilience. So infrastructure, which is very, very expensive, is for sure one of the strategies. Now, what type of infrastructure? How do you design that? How do you finance that? Who has to put the money and at what rate? What are the key criteria for the decision making? Is our institutional framework ready to do that? So uh, what do we need to change in order to be able to do that? And another example that I wanted to share mainly with Jim and Anders is uh, the picture of our Pampas. So as I said before, all this area is a highly, highly productive area and is a, a key part of our economy. And we are for sure facing uh, the climate change impacts in, in this area. So we have a, a more frequent um, occurrence of stronger floods and also significant droughts. So this is an idea and to get it to a real discussion on a potential strategy for managing this area. So this may be a way of uh, generating a new policy for controlling the extremes in the center part of the country. We're talking uh, about uh, 15 to 20 million hectares. And the line that you will see there is a, a potential way of linking the low uh, areas in order to be able to manage the water of this very, very flat territory. So just to give you an idea on, on how flat it is, this is a picture of a flooding in 2001. So this very extended area, several million hectares, at one point, they, they get plenty of water on surface and they don't have the energy to release the water to the ocean quickly. So you have to actually um, be able to adapt to it, to control it and to uh, have some capacity for decision making. Of course, complex issue, I don't expect to discuss it in detail, but this is only to, to give you a sense on what we may be thinking for the next phase of adaptation and the huge potential for sustainable growth that this may imply for a country like Argentina. So in this area, we may be touching on a positive fashion, a very productive capacity of our economy if we are able to develop this strategy using the new technologies. Now, the key points are, do we have the political system to understand it and to approve and to get to consensus on whether this should be done or not? Do we have the capacity for financing this? Is the world uh, um, going to be concerned with this? Argentina is a country that is not emitting a high rate of um, greenhouse gases, but however, it is suffering very significantly from the consequences of climate change. So do we need to increase the capacity of international financing for developing these new policies and these new adaptation projects? These are questions that we would like to see in the mirror of the European experience. I will not get, as I said before, into the details, but this is some of the rationale be be behind these ideas. So, at the end of the day, if we, for example, want to link water, energy and food and to have a strategy for developing sustainable growth in Argentina, 
we may complement our axis number one, which is the Paraná River with another two axes where we do have a huge potential for increasing employment, generating export capacity in a sustainable fashion. But we need to deal with more complex strategies, including climate change and being able to solve those issues or at least to give a higher capacity to our economy and at the same time to increase the productivity. So this is a conceptual way of um, thinking about those challenges. This is actually coming from work a few years ago. And it, I, I learned about this at IASA. Jim is a, is a member of IASA, the International Institute of Applied System Analysis, where I spent some time in 2004. And we are now, I think for the first time in the world, uh, concentrating further and further into adaptation, into the blocks here to the right. And this is a new kind of policies. Uh, and it, it would be very interesting to have the opinions and, and, and the reflections of Shim and Anders on how Europe is actually experiencing these changes in policies and how they see the future. So as a summary, and in order to come back to the, our ambassador Elsa Kelly and later on to Jim and Anders, I would like to finish with a few questions for our discussion. One of them is, how can we create policies for addressing climate change and adaptation to foster sustainable economic growth? The second one is, uh, how to develop those policies in order to create investment opportunities? How do we finance them? Then how to link knowledge and policy making in these issues? Uh, and finally, is democracy governance evolving to cope with these challenges? And last but not least, this pandemic is actually changing or shaping a new agenda in this sense. And what is the European experience and what are the proposals? So thanks a lot. And I would like to come back to Ambassador Elsa Kelly to go on with our meeting. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vera-Sartua. I'm taking the floor only for one reason, that is to make a presentation of our both, both speakers, distinguished speakers today. We're very happy to have them, for sure. I will start with uh, Mr. the presentation of Mr. Jim Hall. He is a professor of climate and environmental risks at Oxford University and Director of Research at the School of Geography and Environment. He is also the Director of the Environmental Change Institute of Oxford University. He is highly recognized internationally for his research and contribution on risk analysis and adaptation to climate change. Professor Hall is member of the British Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology and is expert advisor to the National Infrastructure Commission. He is chair of the Science Advisory Committee of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and has been a member of the United Kingdom Independent Committee on Climate Change Adaptation from 2009 and 2019. I come now to the presentation of Mr. Anders Wittmann. He has served as a member of the European Parliament and also as a member of the Swedish Parliament. He is chairman of the Swedish Association for Recycling of Recycling Industries and a member of the board of the Swedish Development Authority. Since 2017, Mr. Wittmann is chairman of the governing board of EIT Climate KIC. Uh, just as a reminder, let me recall that EIT Climate KIC is a knowledge and innovation community working to accelerate the transition to a zero carbon economy, supported by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. EIT Climate KIC identifies and supports innovation that helps society mitigate and adapt to climate change. It's just an explanation, just in case some people have not, not known about this institution. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Paul, you have the floor. Thank you. You have the floor. 
thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you for this invitation to, to join your meeting today. Um, I'm going in the time I have um, really to cover two areas. Uh, one relates to the governance and policy of adaptation in the United Kingdom. And then secondly, and uh, this also um, responds to some of the questions which uh, Pablo put up at the end of his presentation, um, the question of how we generate knowledge to inform policy and to inform investment decisions. And I'll give, in fact, an example of that in the context of Argentina, um, using an example of some analysis which my team uh, did for the World Bank last year. Um, for my discussion of adaptation policy and governance, what works, what our experience has been, um, I won't use any slides. Um, I'll just talk to you about um, some of the experience that we have had in, in the United Kingdom and my own involvement in that, which, um, as our chairperson said, um, is based on being a member of the Independent Committee on Climate Change within the UK for, for 10 years. Um, in uh, the history of policy response to climate change um, in the UK um, goes back for um, many years, um, some even attributed to um, Margaret Thatcher, who uh, was persuaded as a scientist of the significance of climate change. Um, but really the landmark um, in the UK was the Climate Change Act of 2008, which was passed with all party parliamentary support um, and committed the UK to um, binding carbon targets. At the time they were set at 80% um, reduction from 1990 levels by 2050. In the meantime, Parliament has legislated for a new target of net zero by 2050. Um, and the Committee on Climate Change was created to monitor government's progress towards achieving those targets and to report to Parliament on that. Um, and the committee also crea uh, was created an adaptation role. And it's true to say that at the time Adaptation was had much less visibility than mitigation of climate change, um, but the uh, adaptation subcommittee of the Committee on Climate Change was created to oversee the conduct of a climate change risk assessment every five years and having accurate and regularly updated climate risk information is really crucial. Um, to understand how to prioritise adaptation actions. The um, government was mandated to create, in response to the climate change risk assessment, a national adaptation programme, which should be updated every five years. Um, and the Climate Change Act also brought into being a so-called adaptation reporting power whereby uh, utility companies, crucial pieces of national infrastructure um, were obliged to report when instructed to do so by the Secretary of State on the steps that they were taking to adapt to climate change. And that was in recognition of the fact that um, whilst we suppose that in many instances um, adaptation is in people's self-interest, they um, uh, are motivated to reduce risk to themselves. There are certain pieces of crucial national infrastructure with major systemic impacts which have the potential for major externalities. And so it's government's responsibility to ensure that the owners and operators of that infrastructure are reporting on the steps they're taking to adapt to climate change. Um, th those are the main uh, provisions for adaptation in the Climate Change Act. Um, as I say, I sat on the committee that oversaw all of that for, for 10 years. Um, 
how did that all work in practice? Let me give you a, a, a frank and personal assessment. Um, there is certainly an advantage of having a act of parliament which provides permanence and legislative legitimacy um, to the priority of climate change. Um, politicians come and go. Uh, in the meantime, we've seen politicians who are um, more or less motivated by the urgency of climate change um, and having this enacted in legislation has provided um, a permanence which they, they can't get away from, um, even the more sceptical ones. Um, from an adaptation perspective, um, on the one hand, the argument is actually not very difficult to get across as to why we should be adapting, particularly as we see more frequent impacts of climatic extremes. On the other hand, um, adaptation is very difficult to measure. Um, so it's hard to report on how much progress is being made in the same way as one uh, can report very readily on what is happening to one uh, to a country's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, adaptation is to do with reducing risks. Um, the actual impacts of climate change, which we see, um, we know there's a, a, a large degree of randomness to them. It depends upon the arrival of extreme events, which are basically unpredictable. Um, so the impacts of climate change, which we feel are useful evidence as to whether we're adapting enough or not, um, but they're only a, a, a very unreliable guide. Um, and so reporting on adaptation has been, um, been a challenge, um, though the committee has put in place a whole series of adaptation indicators. I would say that um, within government, how should I put this? Uh, adaptation is quite easy to bureaucratize, um, that it's very easy to say that um, you're creating plans and strategies and policies um, and actually, it's hard to see what's actually happening on the ground. Um, uh, bureaucrats can um, uh, are quite effective at uh, pointing to all of the things that they're doing in order to adapt. Um, and yet it's not in, always clear as to whether this uh, bureaucratic activity is resulting in climate risks being um, reduced on the ground. And what really matters actually is getting adaptation um, embedded, mainstreamed, as one might say, within the most crucial parts of the economy and society. So within infrastructure, um, water, transport, energy, um, within buildings, um, building codes, building construction, building retrofit, and within the natural environment. What steps are we taking to enable the natural environment to adapt to changes, to have space to adapt is the most important thing, and to be in a good condition so that ecosystems are in a better place, a better condition to inherently respond to the pressures that they will sub be subject to from climate change. Um, uh, regulation works in uh, the, we've looked very carefully, for example, at infrastructure sectors and um, the sectors which are more heavily regulated, like our um, railway sector, our energy sector, um, have done more than the less regulated sectors, like the port sector. Um, so being obliged to report and um, a report on what you've done and what steps you've made, um, I'm afraid uh, is, is necessary. Um, you can't just rely on the, uh, the, the self-interest of, uh, of infrastructure operators. And you need information. Um, you need information about where the risks are, um, what are the hazards to which sectors, how big those risks are, and you need that in order to prioritize. 
Um, and at that point, I will um, skip over to just give a, a quick impression of how some of that process of risk assessment and prioritization has been done in Argentina. Before I do that, I just want to check on how long I've got. I don't want to uh, go over time, if you might remind me um, of how much time I might have. Yes, Professor Jim, you have uh, five minutes more, five, seven minutes more, and then Anders, uh, which is now here with us, uh, is going to present. That's absolutely perfect. Five minutes is, uh, is all I need. Um, so I will um, open this presentation here, if I may. And um, can you see my screen here? Uh, yes, perfect. That's that's great. So what I'm um, what I'm just trying to reinforce here, really, the opportunity that now exists to analyze climate risks and use that very high resolution climate risk information to inform decision making. So to inform investment prioritization and finance um, in the way that we were being challenged and to provide knowledge for policy. Um, the, this piece of work I'm going to skip through um, was done um, for the, G, the Global Fund for Disaster Risk Reduction um, in the World Bank with the cooperation um, of the government of Argentina. And um, what we did was to um, analyze on a very broad scale climate risks to the entire multimodal transport network in Argentina, not only looking at the possibility of direct damage, so the exclamation mark in the middle of this picture, which depicts where a, a bridge might fail, but also then the possibility um, for rerouting around the dotted line. Um, and what the wider economic impacts might be, which is depicted by the bar charts here. Um, so what the impacts might be because of supply chain interruptions and impacts on economic sectors. Um, we uh, used very high resolution um, flooding information to assess the extent of exposure, um, both in the present climate and in future climate conditions, how many uh, highways, bridges, railways, airports, ports um, are exposed to uh, flood risk in Argentina. Um, crucial in understanding and prioritizing risks is understanding the um, utilization of those infrastructures. So which are the busiest links in the network um, with the potential to create the most impact in terms of economic disruption. And then by combining the climate risk informa uh, hazard information with the exposure and vulnerability of the networks, we were able to attribute to links in the network where the greatest economic damage potential is located. And you can see that this is measured in terms of um, uh, expected annual losses in um, millions of US dollars per day. So we're highlighting where could there be economic losses um, from climate impacts. The next, once you've done that very high resolution analysis, the next question is, well, what are the adaptation options? Um, and how much might those options cost? And then by comparing um, the risks with the costs of the adaptation options, we're able to prioritize in terms of benefit cost ratio um, where one might invest in terms of improving resilience. What we illustrated is that um, the answer to that calculation is very sensitive to um, the assumption about GDP growth, that's the y-axis, and the assumption about the duration of disruption and um, how many kilometers of road in the top picture or bridges in the bottom picture 
it is um, economical to adapt. So having benefit cost ratio greater than one um, depends on those two crucial assumptions. Um, one of the things that means is that it's it's really worth investing in reducing the time it takes you to recover from a disruption. All of that analysis, and I'm skipping through it very quickly, was encoded in a decision support tool, which enables you to click on any road or railway or asset in the network, um, look at the extent to which the level to which it's at flood risk, um, then look at what the expected damage is, both in the baseline and in future climate scenarios, what the economic losses in terms of millions of dollars per day might be, and then what the benefit cost ratios of adaptation in that asset might be. And what this analysis shows is it's really crucial to prioritize in this way. Um, adaptation is of infrastructure is expensive. And there's um, a, a minority of places in the network where it's really affordable to do that. And you've got to pinpoint those places and make the business case for them. So from this study, um, we were able to say, how big is the risk? Where is it located? How is it going to change in future? And then what are the cost effective adaptation options? And those are really crucial pieces of information for taking forward adaptation policy. So I'll stop sharing my screen there. Um, uh, that was just a very quick run through uh, a, a piece of analysis, but I hope by looking both at the some of those questions around governance and the way in which that's been approached in the UK, and then some of the tools which exist to inform policy, um, you, you've learned something about um, uh, what's been done in relation to adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. And now Mr. Wickman has the floor. Welcome, Mr. Wickman. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm so sorry I could join you at the start. I would have liked to listen to Professor Hall. Um, I'm a fan of British climate policy making uh, because they have really showed an example by the legislation they put in place i think 12 or 13 years ago the climate law as a matter of fact it was an inspiration to me because i was chairing a task force in my own country sweden in 2015 and 2016 and our uh, our, our um, task was to uh, come up with long-term climate strategy and part of that strategy become, became a similar law. And we visited London several times, talking to um, Lord um, uh, Devon and, uh, and the, the, the Secretariat, uh, and being very much inspired by, by this legislation. And I think, as you rightly said, that policymakers are confronted by a lot of short-term challenges all the time. Uh, and if there is legislation that tells the government, regardless of what government, how it should act over the long term, it is, of course, very, very good. Um, I was also intrigued by the last uh, uh, slides about the disaster risk preparedness and prevention. I spent quite some time of my life in the International Red Cross movement, and I've, I've worked on these issues very, very much. But that was before the onset of climate change, really. But already in the 1970s and 80s, we had, um, we had signs that uh, the lack of preparedness uh, from mankind or from human societies was a major problem why increasingly people uh, came in harm's way. Now, I've been asked to, to talk a bit about climate mitigation and adaptation in the European Union context. Um, and if we look back historically, uh, as you know, the European Union, of course, tried to take a lead role on climate change um, 
in the year after the Kyoto Protocol. Um, I was very intimately involved in the policy making ahead of a decision, a, a very crucial decision in 2008, the so-called 2020-20 decision, uh, where we prepare the European Union for the Copenhagen conference in 2009, which everybody hoped would be a breakthrough and lead to a much more ambitious policy at the international level. The 2020-20 was really to increase the percentage of renewable energy in the energy mix to 20%, to enhance energy efficiency to 20%. Um, and the third, what was that? And to reduce greenhouse gases by 20%, over a time period of more than 10 years to 2020. And we thought at the time that that was quite ambitious. In hindsight, it was not very ambitious. Um, quite a number of years passed on without much action. 2009 in Copenhagen was a failure. 2015 was looked upon as a success, but a totally different sort of climate regime was put in place, which is voluntary and where there are pledges but no commitments. And I think the European Union drew one conclusion. If Paris is going to succeed, somebody has to take the lead. Unfortunately, we didn't have a very progressive European leadership until recently. Mr. Juncker, in my opinion, was a total disappointment. He was not really having climate mitigation as a priority. But the new commission that took over in October last year with Ursula von der Leyen has done wonders, I would say. Um, and um, uh, they published what they call the New Green Deal or a European Green Deal in December, uh, which really, really, if you read it, puts everything on place that we have been discussing for, for, for decades. And as an environmentalist, I must say I, I'm, I'm duly impressed by that. And they basically said climate change is already now an emergency. And they added nature protection biodiversity loss is as important. And those two issues are interconnected. So we need policy that, that, that address this from a systemic point of view. What they also said was, this is not only a question of transforming the energy system. It's as much a question of rethinking material use from linear production models to circular production models, and to take a, take a fresh look at uh, in particular agriculture and land use. Um, one further aspect that was brought to the fore was that this has to be a just transition. We have to help people who live in regions which are going to be losers. For instance, some of the coal-based regions in Poland, in Spain, in Germany, etc. Then came the pandemic and then came the recovery package. Um, and the recovery package, which is now we are discussing the details and it's a very ambitious program very much focusing on the same issues as the green deal to retrofit buildings to transform the transformation system to support clean technology and circularity to rethink land use and to focus on the social challenges. And I think the pandemic has made us realize how important it is to act early on signals that something may happen and to build resilience. It has also taught us the interconnectedness in this world. In this global economy, there are so many areas where we are very closely interconnected and where we need joint action. And I think for the first time in the European Union history, we do read policy papers that spell or talk in terms of systems perspectives, systems approaches. That was not happening just a few years ago because we live in a very silo-based vertical structure 
where it has been very difficult for different ministries or departments or directorates in the European Union to work together. But now things are happening. I may sound optimistic. I mean, we still have many hurdles, but, but it, 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 it is positive, I think. The ambition level in terms of climate mitigation also is on the increase. Until today, we are supposed to cut our emissions by 40%, the territorial emissions in the European Union till 2030. The latest is that we should, we should do at least 55%. And whether it will be 55 or 60, I don't know, because you have the European Commission, the European Council and the European Parliament, and they have to agree, and they have not agreed yet. But this is the trend, at least, and I think that is uh, very, very important. There is also a further recognition that we have to reach out much better to developing countries. And in particular, the focus is on Africa and help make the necessary investments in clean technology and in the energy transformation. If you look at investments in developing countries in renewable energy, for instance, in 2018, that's the latest statistics I have, it's about $175 billion. Roughly 80% took place in China, 8, 10% in India, 5, 6% in Brazil. It left Africa be one or 2%. It's ridiculous given also that the population is increasing very, very rapidly. Mitigation has been at the core of the European Union climate change uh, agenda, but of course adaptation is part of it. And very often, I think a systemic perspective should, should be tried. Parts of Europe is very vulnerable uh, to climate change. South Europe for droughts will affect food production, so they have to rethink agriculture, go for more drought-resistant crops, etc. We have a lot of risks when it comes to um, flooding. We have big rivers in Europe that normally floods, and the flooding is supposed to be more and more severe. We have all the coastal areas, not only the Netherlands, where you need to do a lot of investments to proof cities and regions. Um, you have water management, when salt water is encroaching as a, as a big thing. You have agriculture in general, both with regard to coping with less rain or too much rain, but also with regard to trying to, uh, instead of being a carbon source, becoming a carbon sink, uh, building carbon in the soil. And that's just beginning. The common agriculture policy has had no incentives whatsoever in this field. But I think we learn from experience, in particular in the US and in Australia, and to some extent in Switzerland and France, where these kind of practices, whether we call them regenerative agriculture or conservation agriculture, are um, very, very positive for the farmers because it enhances fertility, it enhances retention of water, uh, capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So, so these are, are some areas which are at the forefront when it comes to uh, 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 adaptation. I mostly now mention physical challenges. Uh, storms, flooding, droughts, uh, uh, water, uh, et cetera. Forest fires, we shouldn't forget. My own country suffered from that two years ago very, very badly, and, and Southern Europe is, is on and on again, subject to that. But then you have the other side of the coin, and that are the social aspects um, to, to make sure that people, and in particular people with low income, are not suffering. Um, we should leave no one behind. And one area where I think this is going to be very, very critical, there are some 250 million apartments in the European Union today that needs to be renovated, both in terms of any deficiency, but also because many of them, the large majority, are poor standards, or poor standards. Uh, so here you also will find in many countries, not least in the UK, uh, energy poverty. How can, you, how can you address at the same time retrofitting uh, energy efficiency and uh, the social issues? 
So um, I, I, I think we are in, a, in, a, in the midst of a very fascinating uh, period in the European Union where a lot of things are happening. Um, I think the focus will be very much on cities and regions. Um, I represent something called Climate Kick, which is uh, one of the innovation schemes, public-private partnership. We have focused very much on what we call deep demonstrations where we work with cities, uh, try to apply a systemic approach to innovation to come up with, with good solutions. And when you have these de deep demonstrations and they are successful, you can easily both scale up and scale out. Scale up in the sense of learning for policymakers, scaling out, replicating in, in other parts of, of Europe. So I think I stopped there. Um, I hope I have given you a flavor of the rather dynamic uh, uh, situation we are experiencing when it comes to policy making in this field in the European Union right now. And if you want to be inspired, you could go on the net and read Ursula von der Leyen's major speech the other day, where she gave sort of the State of the Union address, trying to portray where, where are the main priorities in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hall. So now, Professor Jim, thank you, Anders. Pablo, the, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, I'd like to close the meeting, uh, uh, acknowledging everybody that's been following the discussion. I think it's been very, very useful. Um, it is actually quite uh, relevant for our discussion in Argentina to open our eyes to the experience in Europe, in other places, and to try to see how things are really changing at a deeper level um, and what may be the opportunities of reshaping uh, the agenda uh, coming out of the pandemic. So uh, this discussion, I think, has been very um, useful, and I certainly want to uh, thank uh, Jim Hall and Anders Wigman for their time and for their um, uh, open views and uh, transparent opinions on some of these issues that are um, with high political, social, environmental, economic consequences. Uh, Anders, uh, you would like to, to say something? And, and of course, if Jim wants yeah. to say, and we are closing. Very briefly, um, I should share with you that I've been party to a number of conferences organized by OECD over the last 18 months, focusing very much on the circular economy, materials, but also energy, um, in the context of cities. And there have been quite a number of interesting reports with a lot of interesting case studies. Um, I wrote a paper based primarily on climate kick experiences, but also reaching out a bit to other actors that includes uh, quite a number of things that i think could could inspire local action so i think oecd has has has, has a lot of lot of good stuff that 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 you could benefit from so i i i'm happy to share some of that excellent excellent so thank you everybody and we are in touch thank you both and to all thank you thanks bye -bye. thank you very much bye bye